Hi, I'm Mr. Wahlberg. I'm wearing my lucky blue shirt and I'm glad you're here. Today we're going to resume our discussion of advanced placement in United States history, specifically periods one and two of Native American colonization. And today we're in episode five, where we pick up our story of New England and also introduce a new colonial group, the Middle Colonies. We have three objectives today. By the end of this period, you should be able to, number 14, explain how the English Empire expanded in America in the mid-17th century. Number 15, analyze relations among colonists and Indians in America. And number 16, identify the major social and political crises that rocked the colonies in the late 17th century. Let's begin in Roman numeral number 14. The restoration of the English monarchy, you'll remember from our last episode, came in about 1660. That was when the rule of saints of Puritan-controlled Oliver Cromwell England had ended and Charles II retakes the throne. And in 1664, during the Anglo-Dutch War, New Netherland was surrendered by the Dutch without a fight in order to regain their holdings in Africa, Asia, and South America. Basically, the Dutch wanted to go and fight bigger wars and protect their holdings in more important places, and so they surrendered New Netherland to the, England, to the English in 1664. And King Charles II gave uh, the, uh, the Dutch colony of New Netherland to his brother James. James was the Duke of York, and so James took possession of New Netherland, named it after him, his, himself, of New York, and there he ruled it by decree. Which means he never actually lived in New York, but he just ruled over it by issuing orders from abroad. The Dutch surrender in New Netherland guaranteed some freedoms and liberties, but it reversed others, especially for African Americans. Um, are they African Americans? And especially for black people. Maybe that's a better way to say it. New York colonists demanded more liberties, especially the right to consent to taxation. New York colonists, they did get an elected assembly. They drafted a charter of liberties and privileges in 1683. That charter laid out the political organization of this colony, this New York colony. It set up the procedures for election to the assembly, and it guaranteed certain individual rights for the colonists. The colony operated under that charter until May of 1886, when it was assimilated into a bigger area Area known as the Dominion of New England. Sub point B. Let's turn our eyes uh, to the to eastward and maybe south a little bit to Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania was the last of the 17th century colonies to be established. It was given to a proprietor named William Penn. Penn was a Quaker, and Quakers were a particular sect of Christianity that upheld a very strict moral code. Pennsylvania then becomes a colony of Quakers. It was designed as a Quaker refuge for the people persecuted in England to go move to Pennsylvania, and there they developed a pacifistic policy towards Native Americans and became prosperous. The, the Quakers are dedicated to radical pacifism, and that's really the character uh, of the, the, the Pennsylvania colony. Penn envisioned this colony as a haven for spiritual freedom. Quakers believed that all people were imbued by God with an inner light of understanding, and that inner light of understanding opened salvation to everyone. And Quakers believed that liberty was a universal entitlement. Liberty was extended to women, to black people, and to Indians. Well, Penn's frame of government, that document, the frame of government in 1681, it guaranteed religious freedom for all Christians, and it allowed all property-owning men to vote and to hold office. So we see that the Pennsylvania colony in particular becomes the most democratic and the most open of all of the North American English colonies. Penn established an assembly elected by male, male taxpayers and uh, freemen. A majority of the male population could vote, and you weren't even required to be a property owner. He owned all of the colonies land, and then he sold that land to settlers at low prices. Rather than granting it outright to just like his buddies, um, everyone could open to buy a portion of Pennsylvania. Diversity, pacifism, and freedom of conscience, it all made Pennsylvania the most open and the most democratic of all the colonies. It prospered under Penn's policies, and it attracted settlers from several European countries. As Pennsylvania grew, the benevolent Indian policy, though, began to change. As new pressures of population moving into the area, that uh, idea of holding, you know, um, peaceful relations with Native Americans, that found hard to preserve over time. Sub so point D. Now let's talk about the colony of Carolina. Carolina colony is a little bit of a different historical pattern than the other colonies because it was established as a defensive position, a barrier between the Spanish from expanding north out of Florida. Carolina was an offshoot of the Barbados colony, and it was a slave colony from the start. Now, other colonies come with other goals to it. They're not, it's not an agricultural, at least in the beginning, agricultural colony. It's not a trading colony. It's not, it, it doesn't exist for religious reasons or for uh, economic diversity. The Carolina 
Carolina colony was a uniquely defensive position, and that takes a different character. So agriculture wasn't initially important to the economy. It will be later, and we'll get there. The early settlers in Carolina, the Carolina area, they encouraged the Indians of the Carolinas, uh, it's just singular Carolina, sorry, but from 1670 to 1720, uh, to encourage the Indians as to build alliances with the white colonists there, and also to encourage the Indians to go attack the Indians in Spanish Florida, to go capture them and bring them back as slaves, which would then be sold to the other mainland colonies or packed off these Indian slaves out to the West Indies. The government in Carolina was written as a written document known as the Fundamental Constitutions. The Fundamental Constitutions of Carolina, it envisioned a feudal society, similar like what you would find in you know, medieval Europe, but it wasn't actually established that way. It didn't come out that way. The colonial government did allow for some religious toleration, and it also had an elected assembly, and it had a generous headright system of settlement. We'll talk more about the headright system in a previous or in a future episode. And the economy basically didn't grow very much. And I think that you see that reflected in the fact that the colony just wasn't expected to be economically profitable, at least in the beginning. And then the planters discovered the ability to grow rice. And the rice production in Carolina, like the soil is sort of swampy and there's a lot of low-lying areas, which is awesome for rice, but it's kind of crummy for other kinds of crops. But once they figured out how to grow rice there, it actually makes Carolina become the wealthiest elite. The, the landowners of Carolina become the wealthiest elite people in all of English North America. Roman numeral number 15. Various alliances between Indians and European settlers had established this complex and fragile system of relationships and treaties, and uh, it was an uneasy peace when it was peaceful. And when Pequot warriors killed an English trader in 1636, Puritan militiamen and their Indian allies retaliated by massacring about 500 Pequots in 1637. They drove the survivors from the region. Now, if you've heard this before, it's because I said the exact same thing in last episode, and I just haven't edited it out yet, but in order to make it holistic, we'll leave it in and I'll do the video. Seeing themselves as God's chosen people, the Puritans used religious reasons to go justify taking Indian land. The English Puritans viewed Native Americans not as genetically inferior. They're not like lesser humans, but they would be tainted by sin. And that sin, the Puritans believed, accounted for their degenerate condition, the, the primitiveness uh, as it appeared to Europeans of uh, Native American civilization. It wasn't a racial concern, although it does seem to smell like a racial concern. Sub so point B, in the 1670s, there was three times as many white people uh, as Indians in New England. And whites outnumbered, like there was 55,000 white settlers, there was maybe 16,000 Native Americans, so three times as many white settlers as Europeans by the 1670s. And here I want to introduce uh, a Wampanoag chief named Metacom. You'll also hear Metacom referred to as King Philip because that's what the English called him. A name that he seemed to accept, by the way, but we'll use his name of Metacom. So Metacom was the chief of the Wampanoag Indians, and the, king, the English called him King Philip, uh, but seeking to stop European advance in a Native American lands, Metacom forged a military alliance with other native tribes, namely the Narragansetts and the Nipmucks, and he did that in 1650, 1675. In 1675, then, Metacom and his forces attacked nearly 45 English settlement towns. The group attacked white settlements throughout New England, and the fighting continued for uh, an entire year until Metacom himself was killed in, 17, in uh, 1676. The losses were high on both sides, but Indian losses were far worse. 25% of the already diminished Indian population died from the war or the disease associated with the war, uh, and their numbers were already smaller and couldn't really survive that kind of um, uh, that kind of demographic loss. The settlers counterattacked after Metacom's death in, 17, in 1676, and when they did that, they broke Indian power. In what's known as King Philip's War, a lot of the surviving Algonquins, they migrated into the, England, the New England backcountry. Basically, they abandoned what was kind of like the traditional tribal area and just sort of moved into the, the backcountry. And there they intermarried with other Algonquin tribes. Uh, those had stronger ties to the French, and this gives us a little bit of foreshadowing, but the, uh, then they became an ally in future attacks against the English. The Native Americans then teamed up with the French to go attack English, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's go to Roman numeral number 16. In 1688, K 
King James. Okay, so we're going to run through our, our quick um, uh, English king monarchical succession. Uh, when we left off, we had King... Um, uh, Charles II was the king that brought back partying. He was uh, after the English Civil War and Cromwell's rule. You had Charles II retake the throne. And Charles II's brother, James, the Duke of York, whom we met in, in New Amsterdam, James becomes king when Charles um, uh, is, um, dies. And so then in 1688, James is the king of England and he had married a Spanish wife. Now, you'll remember that the Spanish and the English have long-standing um, tension between them, and a lot of it's caught up in religious baggage. And here, you have James, who is the king of England, and therefore the head of the Church of England, the Anglican Church, and he marries a Spanish Catholic. And when they have children, the children are raised Catholic. And this really freaks out the English because now they're worried about like a legacy of Catholic kings in charge of Protestant England and even in charge of a Protestant church, which is awkward, but it raised the prospect of a Catholic heir to the throne. Rather than risk a Catholic succession through James II, a group of English aristocrats invited the Dutch Protestant William of Orange to go assume the throne. This is an interesting situation because um, William of Orange is not English. Orange is a region we might think of today as like closer to uh, closer to Germany. And his wife is Mary Stuart. Mary Stuart was actually King James's daughter from his first wife. And her husband, the William of, uh, William of Orange, is James's nephew. But Parliament approaches William and Mary and say, hey, you guys are good, reliable Protestants. We want you to take the throne. We want you to rise up uh, a, a basically a, a militia to go push the king entirely out of the country. And William and Mary think about that, like, well, that's my dad and my uncle, but king and queen, we're in. I'm oversimplifying, of course, but king and queen, we're in, and they do that. This is known as the Glorious Revolution, because ultimately, very few people were killed, and essentially, William and Mary show up with their army, and James goes, ha, ah! and then, like, he flees, and it's a more or less peaceful overthrow of the crown, and it becomes known as the Glorious Revolution. It's glorious because it's a mostly bloodless coup, but it's also glorious because it's like this restoration of like Protestant monarchy through like the threats of Catholicism. And there they rule together. They actually, we always say William and Mary in like one breath as if they are a single person. They rule together over England and they agreed to rule as constitutional monarchs, which means they are the king and queen, but they accept limits put on them by the parliament. So they become constitutional monarchs, specifically loyal to the Protestant reformed religion. William and Mary also agree to a Bill of Rights in 1689. That Bill of Rights guaranteed individual rights, things like trial by jury, and it was guaranteed from the crown. And parliament adopted a law known as the Toleration Act of 1690 that allowed Protestant dissenters to worship freely, although only Anglicans could hold public office, you see, in 1690, like this move of sort of religious toleration. I mean, everybody's got to be Protestant, but all the flavors of Protestantism are more or less allowed with the Act of Toleration in 1690. Those two acts together, the Bill of Rights and the Toleration Act, they bolstered the idea that liberty was the birthright of all Englishmen. Parliamentary leaders relied on a philosophical position that was really popular in the Enlightenment. There's a great sidebar on here how Enlightenment religion emerges, and we'll talk more about it in a future class, but the par parliamentary leaders relied on one particular particular Enlightenment philosopher who really stood head and toes over all everybody else. His name was John Locke. In his document, The Two Treaties on Government in 1690, it justified the coup of overthrowing the king to go establish somebody that would be more of the will of the people. Because John Locke had rejected the idea of the divine right of kings. That like God had chosen certain people to be monarchs. Locke says, no, that doesn't seem to make sense with his understanding of how God works and how, like, I don't know, hierarchy would work. So instead, uh, Locke says that basically with the, if the king is not doing the things to guarantee the rights of the people, then they've lost the consent of the government and the people can go choose a new leader and that's exactly how William and Mary take the throne. Locke also celebrated individual rights. He believed in a representative government and those things had long lasting influence in the United States and, and other countries thereafter. Subpoint so B, 
Now, how does the glorious revolution then play out in America? Because in 1675, England had established the Lords of Trade to oversee colonies, uh, to oversee the colonies, but the colonies, they weren't actually all that interested in obeying orders from London. So in response, King James II, he, before he's ousted, in response, King James II created what's known as the super colony, the Dominion of New England, where he basically takes all of the New England colonies, the Massachusetts Bay and the Cape Cod, and then the Mid-Atlantic colonies, places like Pennsylvania and New York, and he rolls them all together into one area known as the Dominion of New England. And that covered like all of those areas, um, excuse me, not including Pennsylvania, because Pennsylvania never caused him any trouble because they're just like happy Quakers, right? Uh, but New York, the, the, New, the Connecticut, uh, the Rhode Island colonies, they all get rolled up together into the Dominion of New England. That Dominion of New England centralized control under its governor, um, a guy, kind of an unfortunate figure, named Sir Edmund Andros. And most of the colonists themselves, they really resented the opinion. They really resented the Dominion. They said it had stripped them of their traditional rights and where they had lived for generations. Uh, the, the, the Dominion reintroduced the Church of England to Massachusetts. Puritan leaders had like run it out and refused to allow it. But no, the Dominion of New England goes and it brings in the Anglican Church, the CV established in Massachusetts. News of the glorious revolution in England, when it, re when it reached the Americas, it resulted in an overthrow of that dominion. Basically, the King James II, his creation of the Dominion of New England, once he's no longer king, they're like, well, to heck with this thing. Uh, and they, um, they take Edmund Andros and they stripped him of his powers um, and they basically ship, they put him on a boat and point him to England. Like, ooh, never come back. And, they, and then he overthrew... Um, uh, push back to England. The new monarchs then, William and Mary, they broke up the Dominion of New England. Uh, they didn't restore the Puritan government. That really wasn't their goal. Instead, though, they created a new royal colony of Massachusetts that would roll together Massachusetts Bay and Cape Cod together. Uh, this new royal colony of Massachusetts, and they gave it a new charter that granted religious freedom, and it gave the right to vote to all male property owners, not just members of the Puritan church. In Maryland, down, let's go a little south down to Chesapeake, right? In Maryland, uh, uprisings there as a result of the Glorious Revolution, they had political causes, they have religious causes, no surprise. In Maryland, Protestants had long resented like the rising taxes and the high fees imposed on them by a, a wealthy, mostly Catholic, uh, proprietary officials. Up in New York, the rebellion against the Dominion of New England it began a really a decade of violent political conflict. New York was divided among ethnic lines and economic lines, and the governor of New York was, you know, an appointee of the king. He was hanged, and New York politics remained polarized for years afterwards. Back in England, William and Mary promoted a brand new style of empire based on commerce, a new board of trade in 1698, 1696 that supervised the American settlements. And the result was that the colonies actually experienced a pretty long time of colonial autonomy and kind of lax administration. Essentially, the crown back in England, the parliamentary control back in England, more or less let the colonies, I don't want to say do what they want, but didn't watch them that closely. In New England, Plymouth was absorbed into Massachusetts, and the political structure of Massachusetts became transformed. Land ownership, not church membership, was required to vote. Didn't matter what religion it was, it was a member of land ownership that was the defining line. A governor had been then appointed in London rather than elected by the people. The colony had to abide by the Toleration Act, which increased the power of some non-Puritan merchants and landowners, and this was pretty revolutionary in, in uh, Massachusetts. These events, along with the French and the Indian raids, they created a lot of tension in the New England hotbed of Massachusetts. So point C, we're going to talk about the Salem witch trials, and I think it's really important that we don't overplay this because it's a notable but not huge piece of American history, uh, and its reputation has come on greater than I think the actual conditions were, but let's go ahead and get some things straight on it. It was Puritans who believed that the physical world, and I, there's a lot of like religious believers that still have this opinion. Uh, this is not like some unusual position, but the Puritans believe that the physical world was full of supernatural forces. It basically shows God's manifestation work um, 
in, uh, in everything around us. But also, it shows the competing work of Satan. So there's this supernatural forces. I don't want to get like, you know, Manichaean dualism on it, but basically you have the competition between God and Satan, and you find that particularly as it plays out in unusual events. Trying to influence spiritual forces, um, that's witchcraft, and that was punishable by execution. And a lot of the people that were accused of witchcraft were women. The Puritan civil authorities in Massachusetts and Connecticut, uh, in an effort to go find the witches and push them out of the New England, they hanged 14 people for witchcraft between 1647 and 1662. 14 is an unfortunate number. It's actually not a huge number over that many years, but it's not nothing. And in 1691, though, in, in a single year, in 1691, in Salem, Massachusetts, Several girls suffered fits and nightmares at the same time. All of those immediately become attributed to witchcraft, and, and three women were named as witches in this, uh, in this situation. And the accusations began to snowball. The only way to get protection was to go narc out somebody else, and so the accusations began to snowball, and eventually 175 people were arrested and tried, and 19 of them were hanged in a single year in, in 1692 before the governor's like, whoa, I mean, we've, there have been 14 people executed in a decade and a half, and suddenly 19 people at one time. The governor halted all the prosecutions. People became so revolted over the idea of executions and the mob justice and the, the overplay of all of the hype and excitement that New England stopped legal prosecutions altogether for witchcraft and heresy. Colonists then were encouraged to seek scientific explanations for natural events and illnesses. And here we see, I don't want to say the uncoupling of religion from society, but I think we begin to see sort of the break. That break will play itself out over a lot of ways, over hundreds of years, and I can't wait to tell you more about it. Make sure you like and subscribe. God bless you.